Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor. I'm a Sony Imaging Ambassador, and I'd like to take the opportunity to review the Zeiss Batis 2.8 135mm Prime Lens. Now, this is a long-term review. I've been using this lens on and off for a couple of years now, so I thought it was about time that I did a proper review for this lens. So without much further ado, let's get started. Now, the Zeiss Batis is often described as a mid-length tele, uh, telephoto lens. Now, having said that, it's actually difficult to find any prime lenses longer than the 135 mm focal length. There are, of course, the 400 and 600 mm prime lenses from Sony, but those will cost you an arm and a leg. So for many uh, photographers, this 135 is the longest prime lens that they will possibly own. I actually uh, really like this focal length so much so that I actually own three 135 millimeter lenses and because um, I'm a Sony ambassador and this is a Zeiss lens I have actually purchased this lens so that I can do this long-term review. Now key features include that integrated OLED um, window uh, on the barrel of the lens which will give you a readout of the depth of field. Now this is uh, exceptionally useful on the Zeiss Batis 18mm uh, lens where we can dial in the hyperfocal distance. It is actually less useful on the 135 lens because the hyperfocal distance is likely to be 30 or 40 meters away from the camera and it isn't actually worth having that level of information I don't think in that window. But we do have fast, nearly silent autofocus, and that is good, and it is fast. They are using linear uh, focus motors, so you can use this uh, lens in a sporting context. Now, one of the things that's not advertised on the lens is the fact that it has op optical image stabilization. It doesn't have a steady shot on off button on the lens. So if you are going to start uh, waving the camera around madly following fast moving subjects, then you will need to switch a steady shot off on the camera body. It is of course Zeiss Optics and it does perform exceptionally well. Now I've shot into the light and I have not noticed any chromatic aberrations or color fringing when using this particular lens. It is also lightweight, 614 grams or 1.35 pounds. And this is the lightest of the 135 prime lenses I'm actually going to be showing you um, because there are obviously competing lenses. So let's look at those competing lenses. We have the Zeiss Batis, um, the featherweight of this uh, four lenses that I'm showing here at 1.35 pounds. Uh, the next one up would uh, be the Samyang lens at 772 grams. That's 1.7 pounds and that's a newcomer to the market and that Samyang will be the cheapest of the four lenses. We then have the very popular, uh, very well respected uh, FE 135 uh, Sony G Master Prime there. That comes in at two pounds and then we have the heavyweight of the bunch which is the Sigma 135 1.8 DG HSM art lens at two and a half pounds. That's nearly double the weight of that size Batis. But remember the three on the right have that wider f 1.8 aperture so they have good reason to be a little bit or a lot heavier than that size Batis. Of course, when we're looking at those, um, I'm looking at the Batis, the Sony and the Sigma, the Samyang is right over there on the right. I haven't pictured that on the camera, but it's about the same physical size as the Sony G Master there. We are, of course, getting in a much smaller form factor for that Zeiss Batis. And this might be one of the interesting features for people who don't really need the 1.8 aperture. If you're looking for keeping the kit as light as possible, then that Zeiss Batis might be of interest for somebody looking for a 135 prime lens and of course um, I do like to travel really light my second camera is the compact a7c and I can actually get that in the small pilot 7l messenger bag together with my a1 uh, that a1 in this uh, picture has the batis uh, attached to it with the uh, lens hood folded backwards and of course I've got my a7c with a 35 mil uh, G Master Prime in the same bag and it's a comfortable but snug fit there. 
For some people who are looking um, for lower weight, maybe less price, then of course you might be looking at uh, maybe a 135 Prime instead of a 70 to 200. Now this uh, 70 to 200 in this slide that I'm showing here is the Mark II version, which is lighter than the Mark I version, but that comes in at 2.3 pounds. So that's nearly uh, as heavy as that uh, Sigma 135 1.8. So, uh, but of course we have um, uh, 2007 798 that's the B&H price. Now they are in a little bit of a short supply in 2022 when I'm making this video but of course um, that as uh, Ice Pantis is going to be nearly a thousand well just over one thousand dollars cheaper but of course some people might argue they need the flexibility of that zoom range they can't be restricted by just owning a one focal length that 135. I'm going to showcase why uh, owning a Prime may not be as uh, disadvantageous as owning a Zoom because with modern sensors with uh, megapixel rich we do have the flexibility of um, cropping in post. If we can't walk closer, like I can't walk closer to this uh, Bucking Bronco here, I can always shoot in APS-C mode and still extract a 4K image. So we do have the ability to uh, zoom out by using APS-C mode cropping in camera, or alternatively, if you prefer, you can crop more heavily in post-production. So we can get that 200 mil angle of view with, a, with an F4 equivalent depth of field. Now, if you're owning uh, one of the R cameras, of course, we could go in for a two times crop and still extract that 4K image. So uh, the lens then would be behaving like a 270 millimeter lens with a f5.6 aperture. And of course, so long as we're using really sharp glass, and of course the Zeiss Batis is really sharp glass, then when we crop in tightly, we're still going to be pleasantly surprised with the amount of fine detail that the optical resolution of the lens is capturing. So we don't ne necessarily need to feel disadvantaged because we're cropping in post. And of course, if you own one of the, um, uh, the A1 or the Alpha 7 R4, one of the cameras with, which is really megapixel rich, then we can actually extract the 2.25 times crop. So that takes out this 135 to a 300 millimeter equivalent uh, angle of view if we're cropping that heavily in post-production. This image was actually captured with the 135 G Master, which is exceptionally sharp. And I'm going to be looking at some MTF charts so we can compare sharp with sharp just in a short while. And here is the MTF chart. Now this isn't an MTF chart produced by Sony. This is uh, an MTF chart um, created by Lens Rentals who test 10 lenses and then take out the average. And we can see if you're used to looking at MTF charts, we're looking at the column there on the left, those pairs of lines that um, measured in lines per inch are very close to the top. Anything over 0.6 is re really respectably sharp. So we're getting a, uh, we're getting a really sharp, um, fine detail definition on this Zeiss Batis. And this is working with the aperture at its maximum f2.8 aperture. If we want to compare MTF charts created by Lens Rentals, then we can look at the uh, the MTF chart for the 135 G Master from Sony. Now this one is on the right side of this slide. And you can see obviously the closer the lines to the top of the chart, the sharper the lens. And uh, you can see that even though the 135 is working at a wider aperture, it's performing uh, better than the Zeiss Batis. We've got much uh, sharper detail. Now, sharp and sharp, of course, that uh, in some people, when they're looking at images on Instagram or Facebook, you're not going to be able to see the difference. But of course, if we're going to zoom in to 100% magnification, then that 135 is going to reward you with a little bit extra fine detail. I have to say that is a very impressive MTF chart on the right side. I think um, Lens Rental said it was perhaps the sharpest lens they'd ever tested. And they were pretty blown away by the G Master. So that might be a, de decision, a deciding factor for you if you have to own the absolute sharpest lens and you own a high resolution sensor, an R or an Alpha 1 camera, maybe that will push you towards the 135 1.8 G Master. 
If we want to compare uh, MTF charts again, and this time look at the Sigma's 135 1.8. Again, this uh, chart on the right is uh, looking at the Sigma working at the maximum F 1.8 aperture. You can see the Zeiss Batis now at 2.8 is a little bit sharper than the Sigma 135 at 1.8. And yes, we could probably get the Sigma to match the uh, the Zeiss Batis sharpness if we stop down to 2.8. But of course, um, one might question what's the point of owning a 1.8 lens if you're going to stop down to 2.8 to get your preferred sharpness. Again, if that was the case and you want a lens that is performing brilliantly at a 1.8 maximum aperture, then you would be guided towards that Sony version. The way I prefer to discuss sharpness, however, is just show you images from um, shoots that I've been doing and then give you um, access to ultra high definition images from these shoots. And you can decide yourself whether this uh, lens is sharp enough for you. And you can also uh, ascertain whether that maximum f2.8 aperture is also going to be a problem and whether you should be looking at one of the f1.8 lenses. Okay, so first off, we're getting a head and shoulders portrait with the 135 Batis. And of course, you can see from the figure ground separation, the background blur here, that 2.8 is certainly not looking to be a great disadvantage in this particular instance. So I'm going to show you some more portraits. But before we do that, I'm just going to show you at uh, perhaps at the closer focusing distance now, just to show you how narrow the depth of field is when we get up close and personal with some of the detail we're trying to isolate. And that 135 lens is a really a great focal length for isolating things in the broader scene. Now, I will often go to these events with a wide angle lens as well, but um, most of the time I actually find myself working with the, the mid telephoto lens, either an 85 or a 135. The 135 at events for many photographers get, put you at a more comfortable distance uh, from your subject matter. You don't feel like you're standing so close to complete strangers. I don't want these people to be too self-aware when being photographed. So this uh, 135, gives me this uh, beautiful um, head and shoulder portraits, really shallow depth of field from the 135 focal length, and maybe is probably more appropriate for people who would prefer just to stand one or two uh, steps back compared to using the 85 mil portrait focal length. So as you can see, even when the background subject matter gets a little bit closer, we're still getting good figure ground separation in these portraits. Now, of course, as soon as you go into a multiple portrait with more than one person, you are either going to have to make sure they're exactly the same distance from the lens or start stopping down to maybe five, six or smaller. And then of course, having that F 1.8 aperture, maximum aperture, of course, is of no advantage whatsoever. Here again, working really close, you can see the narrow depth of field now uh, as we get closer to the subject matter. And I do like stacking the different distances here so I get foreground blur as well as background blur. And we can really direct the viewer's attention just to having a small uh, portion of the image in sharp detail, such as the camera in this particular shot. And again, here again, I'm stacking um, layers of information. So we've got some foreground people which are out of focus. Then we've got the hero character uh, in the middle distance and then background blur as well. So uh, just finishing off this one shoot with a half length portrait again, a little bit further away, but still getting good figure ground separation. Let's move the lens now into sort of a landscape context, uh, context an urban landscape. Now, one of the great things about a 135 focal length when shooting urban landscape is it compresses perspective. I do like steep perspective as well, but occasionally I like to bring the very distant information up close and personal to the hero element that uh, we are um, uh, creating in, in the sharpest focus. In this case, it's the arch of this bridge here. So what I'll often do in these situations is I'll capture two or three um, wide angle shots uh, in this instance with the 20 mil f 1.8 G and then quickly move over. And this is where I work most of the time with the 135 focal length 
to compress the perspective. We're bringing that distant um, subject matter of the uh, the bridge that's further away, much closer to the bridge in the foreground. And this is really what I like with this perspective compression. We don't have any areas of empty frame that looks unused. We're um, bringing all of the subject matter closer together with this perspective compression. So certainly working with a 135 focal length certainly gives you a different style of um, landscape imagery when you're working with maybe two different focal lengths. So I'm just limiting yourself to that traditional maybe 1635 zoom that a lot of landscape photographers prefer to use. So again, stopping down perhaps to F8, corner to corner sharpness, because everything is perhaps more than um, 40 or 50 feet away, we're getting that um, um, perspective compression, but there is no shallow depth of field now uh, because everything is on the same focal plane thereabouts. Okay, so another event that you might want to um, uh, use this 135 lens is for in a sporting context. Now, some photographers might consider that the focal length isn't quite long enough for sporting events. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to showcase this image at maybe shooting in a triathlon event. And yes, I could do the portraits before the, uh, the races start. So I can single out individual um, um, sports people in the uh, in the event but then I can quickly move into the actual action uh, itself and of course uh, here we're in the cycling leg and I'm actually capturing a pin sharp image of this cyclist and I've been tracking this cyclist as it's come closer and closer to me and then tracking it at almost the closest focusing distance of the lens as it passes me by using a one two thousandth of a second shutter speed in this instance rather than uh, to create any uh, background blur because we've now got a, a plain wall in the background so I really want to just pin sharp detail of this racing cyclist in this instance. Okay, and uh, another favorite uh, vantage point for a triathlon event is when the swimming leg um, is just um, ending and the, 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 the racers are um, launching themselves out of the water. This, uh, this uh, athlete is bursting out of the water to start running up the beach to uh, get uh, to, the, to their bicycles here. And of course, here's one of the, um, uh, the organizers on their uh, uh, BMW motorcycle also frozen without one two thousandth of a second shutter speed and so you can see the camera has absolutely no problem with pulling focus as a subject gets closer uh, to the camera. And here again working with uh, some of the children exiting the uh, the water leg of the race and again um, I can actually work as the swimmers come right up close to the lens. This is an uncropped image and you can see that we're still tracking focus as the uh, as the, um, as the child comes very, very close. And of course the lens elements now are having to be moved with those uh, linear AF motors very, very quickly to make sure that we don't lose focus as the subject gets very close to the lens. Um, another context is maybe at a protest, I will uh, typically take uh, two camera bodies, two lenses. Um, I like the, using the 35mm f1.4 G Master because it has that shallow depth of field. But uh, I'll again, I'll often work uh, for the majority of the time with that 135 focal length. You can see the 35 mil steeper perspective, bottom left, top right. And then we have uh, top left and bottom right um, uh, chosen or captured with that 135. So when I'm in amongst the crowd, I'm working with the, uh, the wide angle lens, the 35 mil focal length, because I can't step back from my subjects. But as soon as I get to the edge of the crowd and can step back one or two uh, paces, then I'll switch to the camera that's carrying the 135. And I'll often be working with either the Batis if I'm traveling really light or working with the Sony G Master 135. And as we um, showcase some of these portraits, again, you can see as we're doing head and shoulders portrait, that 2.8 aperture is really not an issue when I'm working this close to the subject matters. And uh, as you can see, great figure ground separation on all of these portraits. Okay, so um, as we move through this shoot, I will move on to uh, one more shoot and that's a parade. And again, it's the sort of thing that I'll take two camera bodies, wide angle and either the 85 or 135. So the 85 is often described as the portrait focal length, but of course at these events where you're 
photographing complete strangers and you're only uh, acknowledging each other a second or two before the image is taken sometimes um, a lot of photographers will feel more comfortable using that uh, 135 focal length now most of these images I'm now going to show you are pretty much uncropped so as we go in you'll see that this is actually the working distance I'm choosing to work and I'm actually walking backwards as the parade is moving towards me so we're getting nice figure ground separation on these portraits but we're also uh, tracking something that is never static as well here I'm just uh, pulling focus on the um, the soap bottle soap bubbles here uh, to give a little bit of a difference and again we can see how isolating subjects is really um, uh, one of the uh, great things about this 135 focal length now with a bit of fill flash and uh, again uh, isolating the subject from the background one by using fill flash but also using that 135 focal length okay so you can see this uh, lens really holds up it doesn't matter whether we're shooting into the light often on these very very sunny days i prefer to shoot into the sun um, so we have uh, uh, more of an even um, a flat light over the faces and uh, the Zeiss Batis absolutely has no issues with shooting into the sun in these type of events okay so as you can see some great um, portraits captured with this 135 Batis lens and as Spidey gives you the thumbs up for the 2.8 135 you can probably see why I decided to own um, another 135 lens and uh, I would hate to choose between my G Master and the Batis because I find them uh, are great lenses uh, uh, obviously the uh, the Batis uh, will often um, look more at home on my compact a7c but of course uh, you really have to work out whether you're in the market for that 1.8 aperture or a lightweight uh, Batis 2.8 Okay, so I'm Mark Ayler, Sony Imaging Ambassador. Just remember to check out the links in the info section below the movie. You can head over to the ultra high definition uh, images captured with this lens, and then you can zoom in on that and check out whether you think this lens is sharp enough for you.